are in week two of encouragement or discouragement, say it with me, the choice is yours. How many know the choice is yours? And so uh, I want to start off this morning with a video clip. Now let me go ahead and set this video clip up for you. How many of you have seen the, the, the video clips where sometimes you'll have a, a, a real small kid or maybe something, so kids with some challenge, they can't really play sports, but they'll let them in on one play and let them score a touchdown or something. And so everybody says it's just an encouraging moment. And so, you know, I love them clips. And so here's the one I want to show you this morning. It just, just, it just touches you. Amen. You can see the little fella running out. Amen. This is just so awesome. He don't know which way to go. Come on, how many, how many can relate to that sometimes? I love it. And it's Little League, too, so that's what's so precious about this. Here's the kid. Here's the snap, the handoff. Oh, he's blocking. No, this way. Come on, come on. How many know sometimes in life we get confused, too? But I want you, I, I want you to see the encouragement, though, that that's bringing into someone's life when you, when you put yourself out. <laughs> Look, I mean, just—I mean, he's—he's he's about to score. He's at the ten, the twenty, the fifty. Oh! <laughs> Booyah! <laughs> Some of y'all are sitting there like, no! How cruel is that? <laughs> Why in the world would I show that? Because you can go from encouraged <laughs> to discouraged in the blink of an eye. Wow. How cruel was that? <laughs> now, that was a setup video, okay? It wasn't really the kid knew what was coming. I mean, it was okay. But, but how many know that was, some of y'all are, are laughing like me. I'm like, that, I, I don't, that's horrible, but it's funny. It's, I mean, come out of nowhere, just plow, you know, but, but isn't that how you feel sometimes in life? You're like, man, I, I've struggled, and man, i got other people around me finally believing me, encouraging me, man, I'm about to get to the goal line, and something out of somewhere just comes and just knocks the dog out of you, just throws you for a, how many of you have ever experienced that in your life? And, and, you know, the other guys around were perplexed, like, man, what's up with that? But it only takes one discouragement. Here was two teams devoted to getting a little fella across the line, but one of them decided, you know what, I'm going to have me a moment here, too. Okay, and so it only takes one person to come into your life to erase a whole bunch of good things. But only if you allow it and you choose to get discouraged in it. And that little fella could have got discouraged or he could have got up and said, you know what? A lot of people have never run that far in their life. I may not have made it to the end zone, but I almost got there. I got knocked down. Now the problem with me, I didn't see, did he get up? Did you, do you stay knocked down? Do you stay discouraged? Or do you get up and get encouraged and try again? And again, all that, all that does is come back to us and to what we choose to do. And I want to start out this morning in, in the book of Isaiah chapter 42, in verses 1 through 6. So just kind of hang on with me here while we put that up. And we're going to be reading Isaiah chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. And this is the, everybody say the prophet Isaiah. This is the prophet Isaiah getting a prophetic word about the Messiah, about Jesus to come. He says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elected one whom my soul delights. This is God talking about Messiah. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. I love that. Next verse says, He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the streets. In other words, he's not going to make an open show of himself. He's not going to have the, all, the, all the attention drawn to him by his flashy speech here. The next verse says, a bruised reed he will not break. I love that. You may not say, what that means is if you've gotten knocked down, he's not going to come step on you. You may be bruised, but he's not going to break you. He's going to mend you. Can I have an amen? amen? A smoking flax he will not quench. What does that mean real quickly? I ain't got time to preach this whole sermon, but I do want to make sure you understand what this is saying. A smoking flax means if there's one little amber of fire left in you, he's not going to come put it out. He's going to blow wind on it and try to get refire you up. Can I have an amen there? Amen. He will bring forth justice for truth. Now watch this. Talking about Messiah here to come. Say it with me. He will not fail nor be discouraged. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth. At the coastline shall wait for his law. Thus saith the Lord God, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread the earth and which is to come from it, who gives breath to the people in it, the spirit of those who walk in it. I, the Lord, have called you, everybody say, in righteousness. 
and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you, you as a covenant people, as a light unto the Gentiles. Wow. Somebody say, that's my God. Hallelujah. But how many know discouragement is one of the biggest tools that Satan has in his toolbox to wreck your life? Because if he can get you discouraged, then he's got you. I mean, he's got you in his sides. He's got you in the trap, whether it be offense, discouragement, whatever it may be. Those all go together. And here we have, and I want to go back to verse 4. I love this. It's talking about God here. Verse 4 says, he will not fail nor be discouraged. God's not going to fail, nor is he discouraged. Can I have an amen? Now drop down to verse 6 again. I love this. It's about us now. He's talking here. In verse 6 he says, I the Lord have called you in righteousness. He doesn't call us in self-righteousness. He calls us in the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. Touch your neighbor and say, that's for you right there. And will hold you your hand. I love this next word. And I will keep you. He, what, now, why what, what do you think he's going to keep you? Do you think he's going to keep you encouraged or discouraged? I really believe with all my heart that if God's hand is on you, it's going to be a hand of go get them. You can do it. Rise up. I'm encouraging you. Don't stop. Don't give up. Don't give out. Don't give in. You can do it. My power is sufficient. My stripes are healed. Come on, somebody. Amen. If he says he's going to keep you, he's going to keep you encouraged, not discouraged. Now, when you, when you go on into the New Testament, now we have Jesus is alive. He is on earth. He's not just prophesied about what the prophecy has been fulfilled. Here is Jesus on the earth. He's walking, doing his Father's will. But how many know if anybody on the face of the earth could have walked around in a spirit of discouragement, it would have been Jesus? I mean, he came to set the captives free, to preach the good news, to be accepted. I mean, here he is. He's God's son on the earth. But how many know, everybody say religious folks, they hated him. I mean, the very people he is a part of, and the fiber he's a part of, come to establish, hates him. To the point they just don't hate him, they want to kill him. Yeah. Now, how many know that would be a little discouraging? If, if you were sent to a body and you were, they said, hey, we're part of you, we're part of all worshiping Yahweh, and you said, well, here I am, I'm his son, da, da, da. oh, we hate you. <laughs> we don't just want to hate you, shut you up, we're going to kill you. You know, that might, you might be a little discouraged. How many know that those same religious people accused Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, they accused him of having demons? Remember that? They said, he cast out Beelzebub by Beelzebub. He's the devil himself. <laughs> Come on. And, and so that's the religious people. What about his inner circle? One of his top three of the 12. He had 12, and he had three out of the 12. He hung out with more, more than anybody, Peter, James, and John. And in the last days of his, in the last hours of his life, when he needed them the most, Peter denies him three times. That could be discouraging. How would you like to be walking across up the Via Della Rosa and hear somebody ask Peter if they knew him? Peter goes like, mm, blank, no, I don't know him. I mean, he did, he, if, you, if you really studied it out, he used words that would be what we consider cuss words today. Blank, no, I don't know him. That'd be a little discouraging. Not only are you going to die, but now the people who's with you, they deny you. Come on, somebody. And then you got one of your own, sold you out for 30 pieces of silver. Judas betrayed him, one of his own. I mean, man, that might be a little discouraging. Hey, are you with me? And, and today you may be sitting in here going, now you look at Jesus' life here. We had his, his family and friends left him. Even a bunch of his family members left him when he declared who he was and that communion, you're going, you're going to drink my blood and eat my body. A bunch of them said, man, we can't handle it. Anybody says we've got to drink blood and eat your body. We're gone. His family dis disowned him. A lot of his family and friends. His close friends, his religion that he was supposed to come into and just really just take the, the, no place he'd ever been before denied him. And then money denied him. Money bought, it, bought his friend out, betrayed him. All this relation, every single thing about life that can happen to being discouraging happened to Jesus. Family, friends, and finances. <laughs> so no matter where you're at today, you may have some family issues. You may be the family issue. I don't know. Come on. <laughs> you may be, I don't know, okay? But you, you may either, you either are or in maybe some family issues. Your marriage may or may not be good. Your finances may be discouraging. Everything around you may be discouraging. But let me tell you something. You've got to find that place of encouragement and rise above that discouragement. All those things are just temptations to see if you'll get discouraged. It doesn't mean you have to go that path. Are you with me? So you may have trouble in your homes, your marriage, your kid, your job, your finances, your, whatever you're involved in. Yeah, there may be some discouraging things happen. Why? That's to see if your courage will last. Discouragement. It's all about your courage to live life at the level Jesus Christ told you you could have it. 
Encouragement means your, your, your courage has been strengthened to go through these things, not fall prey to them. And I want to show you four other people in the Bible. Just, just I mean, there's, everybody in the Bible had discouragement. But four of our major players in the Bible, a couple from the Old Testament, a couple from the New Testament. David, King, everybody say King David. <laughs> I mean, and I ain't got time to go, I, every one of these could be a standalone sermons by themselves. They got discouraged, they did, but they didn't keep it. They had that moment when it was real, the facts were there, it, this stuff's really going on, we're not trying to live in a, in a la-la land where, yo, oh, nothing's ever bad going to happen, bad things happen. We live in a fallen, sinful world, guys. But again, it's our choice how to respond to it. Turn your name and say, it's your choice. So here we have, David was out at war. He comes back to Ziklag. Say Ziklag. Why did I have you say Ziklag? Because that's just a cool name. That's the only reason I wanted you to say it. There, that, isn't that a cool place? Wouldn't you like to be from Ziklag? Where are you from? Ziklag. That's, that's just, I don't care who you are. That's just cool right there. But anyway, he comes back to Ziklag, and while he's gone, the Amorites have all come in and raided his village, stole all the women, all the children, grandchildren, Wives, everybody, everything gone, and him, him and all of his army comes back, and his, everybody's gone. And the Bible goes on saying, I'm not going to read all of them, I'm just going to read out of, out of 1 Samuel chapter 50, or excuse me, chapter 30. He gets back, and man, everything's gone, and, and they want to kill him. His own men, like, you took us out to war. If we'd have been here to defend our families, none of this would have happened. And so go ahead and put up verse 6 out of 1 Samuel chapter 30. It says this right here. <laughs> but now David was greatly distressed. Now, if people want to kill you, would you be a little stressed? Yeah, yeah okay, all right. For the people spoke of stoning him because the souls of all the people, they were grieved. In other words, they were, they were discouraged. They were grieved. Every man for his son and his daughters, their families were gone. But now watch this. David went and boo-hooed and cried with them. David come up with all the excuses of what was going on. No, David didn't do none of that stuff. But David strengthened what? Oh. Other translation says David encouraged himself. David encouraged himself, he strengthened himself in the Lord our God. And I ain't got time to, to go into the whole story, but he calls for one of the most strengthening things and one of the most encouraging things when you're alone that you can do. There's two, there's two things, actually there's three great things when you get discouraged and nobody's there to pat you on the back and say, boy, come on, it's going to be all right. There's no encourager around. There are three main places you can go to. One of them is prayer. But often when we're discouraged, it's really kind of maybe not good for us to pray if we can't pray in encouragement. <laughs> yeah, you just heard that. <laughs> the pastor encouraging you not to pray. Don't pray discouraging prayers. Don't go to the Lord with a wine list. Go to the Lord with his word of exaltation. But prayer is one of them. Reading the word. Quoting the word is a good one. But the third one to me has been one of the most powerful ones in my life. When I'm alone, nobody else is there to, to pick you up. You're just those thoughts, man, Satan's throwing at you. Just bam, 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 bam. He's just rapid firing you. It's to worship. Just start worshiping right in the face of discouragement. Right in the face of the enemy lying to you. Just start worshiping about how good your God is. And that's what David did. How did David strengthen and encourage himself? It goes on and says, David called for the ephod, which is a worship garment you wore to worship. He got his worship gear on, and he went and he began to worship and praise and declare God's word as he knew it in that day. And God told him, he said, you'll go after him. He said, do I go after him, Lord? What do I do? Do I go out here and get... No, David, David heard from the Lord through prayer, through worship, and declaring the word, go get an army, you'll go chase them. He went, long story short, he went after them, killed all of them, got their wives, got their children, all their children back, and plundered them. Yeah. Why? Because he didn't stay discouraged in that moment when he had a choice. Yeah. Now, he could have went, oh, I know, it's awful, it's just terrible, I don't know what to do. If he had stayed in that situation, they'd have probably stoned him, and I don't blame him. Everybody wants to be a leader until it's time to make a hard decision. Amen. Then all of a sudden, we don't want the job. <laughs> it ain't as fun as you think it is. David had lost his wife. David had lost his kids at that moment. But at that same moment, with all the loss, David didn't lose God. So no matter what you've lost, believe it or not, it may even feel like you've lost, you haven't lost God. Can I have a better amen? amen. Let's move on real quickly this morning. Now, I'm going to bring this one into, to, I told you, a, a person, but it wasn't just a person, it was Moses got discouraged, 
But Moses got discouraged because the whole nation become discouraged. And you know what's going on in America right now? They're wanting a whole nation on both sides of the aisle to be discouraged with each other. And be divided because a house divided cannot stand. Numbers chapter 21, verse 4 and 5. This is about Israel. Then they journeyed from Mount Horah to the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the souls of the people became what? Very, very discouraged on the way. The souls of the people, their flesh, their mind, their will, and their emotions, the Bible says, became very discouraged on the way. And the next verse, now watch this. This is a whole nation. This is a nation, guys. This ain't a handful of people. And the people spoke against, say it with me, God and Moses. Now remember that. They spoke against who? God and Moses. So they blamed God and they blamed Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no food, there's no water. Our, our souls loathe this worthless bread. Mm. And again, each one of these could be a, a total message on their own, but I ain't got time to do that. How many know that discouragement spreads like wildfire? Encouragement stays in the little camp most of the time. A few people might get encouraged if you share little things, but oh, that's not that thing. But you let something discouraging happen, and everybody wants to come see it. And then everybody wants to tell their version of it. Come on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. And so here we have probably just in that whole nation of people of Israel, it was probably only a handful of people, and it probably it, it absolutely had to start with one person's voice. Man, we'd have been better off if we'd stayed in Egypt. Why did God want to bring us out here? You know you right. You're right. I didn't think about it. You're right. I'm glad you, you, you got me part of your sin. I'm glad you invited me into your doubt and your fear and, and your discouragement. Ah, that's what I've been waiting on. And that one, those two began to talk, and two more began to talk, and two more began to talk, and that thing rolled and multiplied overnight, and man, next thing you know, <laughs> look here now, they're blaming God and the preacher. <laughs> Boy, have I, I, know, I know what that's like. You know, because if something goes wrong, it's got to be God and the preacher's fault. Surely it couldn't be the, the, the choices you made. It's our fault. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> let, let me just encourage you. You may want to write this down. One of the greatest things you can do when you are discouraged, keep your mouth shut. <clears throat> let me say that again in case you did not get that. Anytime when you have discouragement come upon you or somebody speaks it on to you, here's a greatest best thing you can do with it keep your mouth say it with me shut because if you keep your mouth shut it will not go out of your mouth and it will not cause more damage but oh what do we love to do when we get discouraged we love bad news discouraging news tragedy more than we love the good news of Jesus Christ I can prove it to you Go talk to somebody. They'll tell you everything going wrong. They'll tell you the tragedy they saw. They'll they'll somebody will talk about this film. You wouldn't believe what they showed at church. It was so encouraging. I was such a boom. I don't know why he showed that at church. I mean, my heart was just so warm, and then he just crushed my heart. It's the pastor's fault. If that discouraged you, don't tell nobody about it. If it encouraged you, made you laugh, you got a sick sense of humor like I do, share that video. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. But, but if we learn to keep our mouth shut, discouragement stops. But when we open our mouth, discourage, discouragement is perpetuated and it just keeps on rolling and growing. And again, it's our choice. Nobody makes us talk about our discouragement. We voluntarily do that. Can I get an amen? amen. Now, the reason I tell you to keep your mouth shut is because what happens in the next verses. There's a reason I told you to keep your mouth shut because I love you. And I don't want to see nothing happen to you. Because how many know God don't like ugly? Amen. Amen? So, so remember, here's what happened. They're out of Egypt. Things are not going as they think it should be. They're discouraged, so they blame God and they blame the preacher. They bad mouth in God and they bad mouth in the pastor. Yeah. Now let's take a look at the very next verses. We're not skipping any verses. Go down to verse 6 and 7. Here's what's happened. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. Yeah. And they bit the people. And many, and, uh, and many of the people of Israel died. Yeah. Next verse says, Therefore the people now came to the pastor, Moses, and said, Oh, we have sinned. 
For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he takes away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. <laughs> so you talk bad about me? <laughs> Just saying. Now I'm wondering what's going on around, uh, where are they at this morning? Yeah, I wonder what's going on around y'all's house. Y'all been bad about the pastor? <laughs> they ain't been bitch yet. They got, they got like a den of rattlesnakes over around there. How many y'all done killed? Five, three to five rattlesnakes around the house. So, so somebody, y'all may well, watch them. <laughs> nah, they're, they're, they're awesome people, though, you know. That, but, but how many know, again, God's response to their discouragement was, you think I'm going to take and listen to your discouragement and reward that? No. Man, you're putting yourself on fiery serpent ground when you have a mouth of discouragement. Amen. Touch your neighbor and say, that's in the Bible. So I'm just going to move on. Let's get to the New Testament. <laughs> Hallelujah. So now we move into Paul's life. The Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul who wrote nearly all the New Testament Bible inspired by God himself. Paul, dude, Paul was like beaten and shipwrecked. He was bit by a snake. He didn't die. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. But I want you to watch Paul, even through all his stuff, look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 5 and 6. I love what Paul says in that scripture. He says this right here, he says, For indeed, when we came to Macedonia, our bodies had no rest. Anyway, they were tired. We were troubled on every side. Things weren't going as planned. Outside were conflicts, and inside there were fears. Come on, how many of y'all can say, I know what Paul feels like? I mean, I turn this way, and there's some problems. I turn this way, I'm afraid of this, something's not going to turn out right. I'm, I'm tired. Come on, he was tired. He was physically tired. He was mentally and emotionally tired. He was spiritually tired. Problems were rising up. People were trying to kill him. People hated him. People were setting him up to fall, trying to trick him and all this stuff. Man, he's getting shipwrecked in prison, beaten. Let go. Hey, man, he's riding a roller coaster, dude. Talk about an emotional roller coaster. All this junk happening to Paul's life, just like me and you. Just like me and you sometimes. But watch, watch his attitude here, verse, next verse, verse 6. <laughs> nevertheless, everybody say nevertheless. nevertheless. The fact is, all that's going on, but nevertheless, God. I love those two things. Nevertheless, just God. Nevertheless, say it with me, God. God, who comforts the downcast, comforted us by the coming of Titus. Now, we talked about the word comfort last week. What it really means is the word encouragement. So in other words, nevertheless, God who encourages the downcast, encouraged us by the coming of Titus. Everybody say Titus. He's got a little bitty book. He's in there, but he's got a little book. And he was considered one of the more minor prophets. Paul was the major prophetic apostolic voice of the day. He was the man. And the man had trouble all around him. The man had temptations of discouragement. And what did God send him to do it? He sent in one of the minor prophets, Titus, to encourage him. So let me tell you this. It don't take, you don't got to be encouraged from the superstars. Right. Encouragement doesn't necessarily come from who you think it's going to come from sometimes. Don't, don't, a child sometimes can be the most encouraging person in an adult world. Sometimes the one who may not be as educated as you or don't have the degree you have or, or don't been around and exposed can say some of the most profound things if you'll just shut up and listen. And again, if you're not complaining, sometimes you can listen to encouragement. One of the main reasons some people can't hear encouragement is because you don't shut up long enough about your whining and complaining to hear encouragement. Oh, did that fall out of my mouth? I think it did. Everybody say moving right along. So now let's go to John the Baptist. We can pick up this story about John. John's in jail for proclaiming Christ as the Messiah. He's been, a chick tricked the king into getting him in there. He's going to be beheaded. He knows he's going to be beheaded. And Now, how many know what John the Baptist is? He was the forerunner to Christ. He announced Jesus as the Messiah, the first one. Publicly announced him. He got to baptize Jesus. Now, that's some status. Amen. Ain't but one person in the created world say, dude, I, I baptized Jesus. How many know that's a baptism? I, I baptized Jesus. I declared, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Yeah. I said, I don't need to do it. He said, you better do it. Okay. <laughs> John saw with his own eyes the dove descend from heaven, light on Jesus, and remain on Jesus. 
proclaimed he's Messiah, saw the Holy Spirit fill him after he's baptizing, and here John is in a place of discouragement, a place of, of temptation, and Luke 17, or excuse me, Luke 7, verse 19, John is thinking, oh no, John calling two of his disciples, not Jesus, two of John's disciples to himself, he sent them to Jesus and said, I want you to ask Jesus this question for me. Are you the coming one or do we look for another? Wow! How in the world do you go from pronouncing, Behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sins of the world. I baptize you. I see the Holy Spirit descend upon you. I see the signs, wonders, and miracles. But now I'm in a jam. And you're not doing what I thought you could, should do for me. And I'm discouraged. Are you even the one now? How many know if, if discouragement can hit a man of God like that? How many know it can hit me and you? Amen. I mean, he's sending his disciples to Jesus. Are you the one? Now, we're not asking. Now, if I'd have been that disciple, I'd have said, now, look, this ain't from us. This is from John. We, we, we know who you are. We, we've been declaring who you are. He the one now in doubt. Not me. I'm, I'm, I'm not getting into that, but, but because I'm his disciple, I'm going to come to you, Jesus. This is what John wants to know now. Are you the one or should they be looking for another? Now, Jesus is full of compassion. But he didn't coddle John. He didn't coddle John. How many of you know a lot of times the only reason you, you run in your mouth about your discouragement, you want somebody to coddle you? <coughs> Pat you little tushies. Tell you it's going to be all right. Chin up. And I mean, no, we need encouragement. But sometimes there ain't nobody around to encourage you, just like David. There wasn't nobody there to encourage you. Nobody was telling David it's going to be okay. They were saying, hey, we're going to stone you. Yeah. David said, I, I ain't got nobody to encourage me nowhere. L but let, I ain't lost God. Let me encourage myself. Worship and praise God. And here's John in his pity party in his cell. Now, again, it, I probably would be doing this. I don't know. It's hard to say unless you walk there. But John has the audacity to ask Jesus, are you the one or do we look for another? Wow. Look at Jesus' response in verse 22 and 23. This is after the disciples come and ask Jesus. Jesus answered and said to them, I tell you what you do. You go tell John these things you have seen and heard. The blind see, <laughs> the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Amen. Not, John, I'm sorry, I'll be there in a little bit. No, John, you, he's reminding John of what encouraged him. Amen. He didn't go coddle him. He didn't say, tell him everything's going to be all right. I'm fixing to spring you out of jail. I'm going to send an angel down, kill all them. You're going to walk out glorified. You're going to be my right-hand man because you've been in jail for me. No, he said, dude, don't you, you know. Don't bring me this kind of question. You know who I am. And then the last verse, he says this right here right before he goes. Oh, and by the way, tell him this right here. Blessed is he who is not offended because of me. That was a kind of a... He knew he got discouraged. Listen to me now. Listen to me real closely. When you get discouraged, it will cause you to question and hate the wrong people. Are you listening to me now? When you get discouraged, it will make friends become enemies. When you get discouraged, it'll turn people you trust into people you don't trust no more. It'll make you question even God. What did Israel do? Blame God and the preacher. When you get discouraged, one of the first people you want to blame is those that, that, that you have a relationship with. Now let me ask you this. In your marriage, whose fault is it? All right, let's don't say it out loud. Let's just point. One, on the count of three, point to whose fault it is. One, two, three, go. Everybody's pointing over here. The reason you argue in your marriage is not because you like to argue, is it? It's because of what they do. And if they didn't do that, then we wouldn't argue. Problem solved. No, the problem is not solved because you are the problem. You have not acted perfect either. And you didn't want them getting discouraged and fussing at you when you wasn't perfect. You wanted grace and mercy, but yet you don't want to extend grace and mercy. You want to walk around discouragement because if you're discouraged, it can justify your actions towards your spouse or anyone else. Discouragement will just, is a self-justification of your act, actions towards your spouse, your boss, your job, everybody else, your pastor, your church, and even God. When you've got a discouraged spirit, touch your neighbor and say, let's don't do this. 
<laughs> Amen? Y'all okay? Let me kind of start landing this plane. I want to give you this morning, you may want to write these down. Three voices that will always be speaking discouragement into your life. They are the three main sources of discouragement in your life. Number one, of course, is the devil himself. How many know the devil is never going to encourage you? Amen. Well, what if I'm sinning real good? Will he encourage me to sin? No, he will not encourage you to sin. He will, the only way you understand it is encouragement is he just keeps you in a discouraged spirit. Because a discouraged spirit is an encouragement to sin. He'll never encourage you even to sin. He'll just keep you in discouragement because he knows that leads you to sin. Are you with me? See, he can't, he can't be an encourager in nothing. It's not in him. He's always a discourager. He, he, again, he cloaks it in deception as encouragement. Oh, that's going to be fun. That's gonna, you deserve it. Come on. That sounds encouraging, not when it's Satan. He knows that if you say you deserve it, that means you're discouraged about something you didn't get, so you're going to go do something you don't shouldn't do. Oh, touch your neighbor and say, you better get some of this. Come on now. Satan's voice will always be telling you, you never will be good enough. You'll never amount to nothing. You can't get over it. God can't love you. It's always negative. Always negative. Are you listening to me this morning, church? Listen to me now. One of Satan's title that God put on him. I mean, if God puts a title on you, that's who you are. So, so some of the titles God has put on you is my beloved children. Come on. My sons and my daughters. Heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Righteousness. That's some of the things he's put on us, and that's who we are in Christ. Here's one of the titles, one of the main titles he put on Satan where we would know. He's the father of lies. So in other words, he says it's good for you, it's bad for you. If he says you need to do that, you need to do right the opposite. Come on. Why? Because he's always going to do something to get you discouraged and blame other people, have offense, and fall out of relationships and fall out of love with God and anybody else. So I think we all know number one. I think we all know the devil's bad for us too. Number two. Are you writing this down? Say yeah. yeah. <laughs> number two is other people. Other people. This can be family. It can be friends. It can be associates. It can be co-workers. How I many you know other people sometimes are some of the worst voices you can allow in your ears? Oh, but we listen to them. When, when they were looking at going into the promised land, they sent some spies in. I mean, you know, the, the bulk of them come back and said, oh, we can't. We must not go. They're big. They're giants. And the other two, Caleb and Joshua, said, no, we can take it. That's right. That's right. Had they listened to the majority of the people say no and bring a discouraging report back, they never would have crossed. But two of the ten, two of the ten said, we can do this. Our God has said. Come on, somebody. Other people, <laughs> don't listen to other people. Don't listen to other people. If it brings discouragement, now, let, let me preface this by saying, if you're wanting to do something, let's say you're wanting to buy, you're wanting to buy something, I don't know, a big statue or something, and somebody comes up and says, now listen, well, I'm not here to discourage you, but have you thought about how you're going to pay for it? No, but I want it. I don't care, it's pretty. And I deserve it. See, that's a lie from the devil. I deserve this. I worked hard. I deserve this. It's a lie from the devil. Do you deserve it? Yes. You deserve it under God's plan of getting it, but not under Satan's plan. Because, see, if God tells you you deserve it, then you're going to get it, and it's going to be a financial blessing. But if Satan tells you you deserve it, and you go out of God's will and get it, it's going to be a financial burden. Discouragement, encouragement. When you get it, it's a financial blessing. It is a financial blessing. You enjoy it. You probably share with others or you have it, the te testimony. When you get it, it is a financial burden. You're, you suffer for it. Your family suffers for it. Because how many know one of the two main things that most couples argue over is money? Yeah. Everybody say money. money. And, I've, and even though most of you know my story, I've never had a couple come into my office and say, we've got too much money. <laughs> it's causing us problems. And I sit here today, and again, I tell every one of you, if you ever get into a problem where you've got too much money and it's causing problems, I can fix you. I'm, I can fix that. We will, be building, we will be building campuses. We'll be launching churches, orphanages, hospitals. You just bring it on. I'll spend it for the kingdom. If you've got too much money today, you just come see me. We'll, fuck, we'll fix that real fast. We will be a blessing to you, and you'll be a blessing to the kingdom of God. Can I have an amen? amen. So, but now I want you to... 
Would you watch it? Other people, other people speaking into your life can cause you damage. Yeah. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 3, real fast. This is when they were rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. I love this story. I love to preach the whole way through Numbers. It's just a transitioning book that's beautiful. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, at the, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I, Nehemiah, had rebuilt the wall, and there were no breaks in left in it, though at the time I had not hung the doors and the gates yet. So here it is. First of all, they said it would never happen. They said even if they build the walls, when foxes run across them, they'll break down, just constantly discouraging them, discouraging them, and threatening to attack them while they're building it. And, and, and Nehemiah said, here's the way I want you to work. You lay bricks with one hand and a sword on the other. Come on, there's, oh, there's, there's so many messages in Nehemiah. But anyway, I ain't got time for that. It's, but uh, here it is. Now it's done. It's strong. All they got to do is hang the gates and the walls up, and it's over with. Jerusalem's strength is back. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, so here it is. Now watch this. And, and, and Samuel and Tobiah and Geshem knows about it, and they, they hate it. They want to discourage them. They couldn't get this people divided. The people stay unified. They didn't get in fear and run when they threatened them. They unified themselves, got together, encouraged each other, built this wall. It's about to be done. And so they got to launch another plan. Next verse says, then Sanballat and Geshem went to, went to me saying, hey, come let us meet together among the village in the plain of, everybody say, oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> but Nehemiah, the prophet of God here, he knows what's going on. They sought to do him harm. We take out the leader, everybody else will fall. The we won't allow the gates to go on. So I sent a message, next verse says, so I sent a message back to them saying, <laughs> I am doing a great work, everybody say a great work. great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave and go down to you? Man, I hope you see that from the spirit of encouragement there. He's, a, he's, he's fixing to cross the finish line, and that linebacker's coming at him. Now, in this case, the Lord tells him, you keep on running, don't pay no attention. See, there's some things I really feel like some of you are you're that close to a breakthrough. I really do. I feel like there's some of you in here today, you may be that close to your breakthrough, and you, you've shouted, you've glorified, you've done, and that, and that, and that, and that, but some things have happened, and you list, start listening to other people, and you turn away, and you're that close. Don't let the other people, had he worried about what they were saying, had he worried about their opinion, had he heard their words, well, I need to go down and meet with them, they'd have killed him. And there's literally some people you may be hanging out with in their words. They're killing you. They're killing your marriage. They're killing your family. They're killing your vision and your ideas that God's given you for your life. And you're listening to that garbage. And they're influencing you. And they have influence over you. And you are allowing them to turn you at your breakthrough. Shut those people's mouths off from your listening ability. Don't give ear to even a friend if it's discouragement against what God's plan is. Now, friends can encourage you to do the right thing, and you may see it as discouragement, but it's not. A true friend will always have the Word of God to back up what they tell you. Are you listening to me? If a friend of yours is speaking into you, and you say, show me that in the Word, and they can't show it to you in the Word, you may just want to say, you know what, let me file that in the delete. Everybody say delete. delete. You need to delete some words that's been spoken over you today. Can I have an amen? 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 Don't go to the place of oh no with anyone. That's what you want to Come down to oh no. Because in oh no, everything's oh no. Well, I'm going to get saved. Oh no, you don't. No, you don't want to get saved today. God, God wants me to get saved today, y'all. Oh no, he don't. That's what, that's what the devil will tell you. That's what the enemy will tell you. That's what other people. Oh no, you don't. You've done this. You're too, you're, you're too messed up to get saved. Well, I'm going to join Journey Church. Oh no, you're not. That's a, that's a crazy place. Come on. It's always oh no. Everybody say oh no. Oh, oh. I mean, I'm going to serve on this team. Oh, no, you don't want to do that. That'll take up too much of your time. Yeah. Oh, you don't understand, man. The glory of God hit me. I begin to speak in tongues. Oh, heck no. Oh, heck no, that ain't allowed. You can't do that in today's time. Always discouragement from God. Satan will always discourage you from God and anything godly. <laughs> Are y'all okay? Are y'all ready for the final one? Come on up, team. First person that will discourage you is who? Satan. Second people that will discourage you is who? Other people. You want to know who the third one is? Yourself. Yourself. Those are the three main voices you listen to. Now, I'm not saying you listen to Satan's voice all the time, but 
incoherently sometimes we listen to Satan more than we do God. Because we, again, if you want to know, just go back, look at, your, look at what you talk about all the time and see if it's complaining and whining, tearing down, and see how much of it is edifying, building up, and talking about how good God is in the future. Go back again, I challenge, I think, did I challenge y'all last week? Go back to your social media about three months and just look at what you post. And that'll tell you whether you're a discourager, a discourager or an encourager, whether you are discouraged or encouraged yourself. Go back and look what you post. Problems, drama, gossip, da 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 Now, if you just post this video, everybody will think you're fine now. So anyway, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Amen? Anytime you repeat what the enemy's saying or you repeat what other people are saying, you are setting yourself up to fall right into Satan's trap to keep you from everything God wants to bless you with. Every time. People who are married complain about... Come on. People who are married complain about what? Their marriage. People who are married... Raise your hand if you've ever complained about your marriage up in here. Come on, raise your hand if you've ever complained about your marriage at any time in your life. Now, I'm going to step on out here a little further. Guess what people complain about that have kids? If you've ever complained about your child, raise that hand up again. Look at all the good parents in here. So married people complain about their marriage. You know what single people complain about? Being single. Now, all you single folks, let me tell you something. When you get married, you won't complain about being single no more. You complain about being married. <laughs> it, uh, I'm going to go King James on y'all. This ought not be so. Okay, We ought not be complaining about our marriage. We ought not be complaining about our kids. But it's so easy to do and we're discouraged. And they get on our nerves and it's just, ah! What do Christians complain about? God. They complain about God. I don't know why God ain't doing this. I don't know why God ain't doing that. I don't know why God won't answer my prayer. What's God doing? God, are you doing it? I said, what do Christians complain about? What do church people complain about? Church. I don't know why they got to sing that. I don't know why they got to have that. I don't know why they're doing this. I don't know why they... I don't know why they... My goodness. Look at what we are choosing to do. Remember, the subtitle of this message is what? It's your choice. And we make the choice anytime we don't like it a little bit, we don't understand it just a smidgen, or we're not sure, we usually get discouraged and complain. When we ought to be encouraging. When your marriage ain't going right, you know what you should be doing to your marriage? Encouraging your marriage to get better, not worse. When your kid messes up, you should encourage them. Well, you got to get a belt to do it or what? I don't care. I mean, you know, that can be some encouragement. In love, that can be some encouragement. Kids are going, no, character going, yeah, I like this message. Glad we came today, honey. The pastor wants us to go home with our kids. The kids be like, why are you whipping me? The pastor said so, hush. <laughs> blame it on, see, you blame it on God and the pastor again. Why do we complain against the very people we love the most? I hadn't figured that out. I don't know. It's demonic. It's, it's literally, it's demonic. And we got to get that demonic spirit from oppressing us in our mouths. Can I leave you with one encouraging thing? <laughs> Somebody say, please do. <laughs> please, after that, please. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This book of the word of God, the law, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, that you may observe and do according to all, everybody say all, to all that is written in it. For then, I'm encouraging, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will know how to have success, good success. Why is our marriage not, why is our kids? Why is our finances? Well, why is our church? Well, why is the pastor doing this? Well, why is the man doing it? Well, why is this? I don't understand this. 
get all that stuff laid aside. Open this bad boy up right here and begin to be encouraged. Begin to observe and do all, not some, all that's written in this book. And then you're going to prosper. Then you're going to go. You'll have good success. Can I have an amen? amen? So let me encourage you today. Jesus was tempted to be discouraged. He didn't walk in it. All the other guys, the David, Moses, Paul, John the Baptist, they had discouragement. It was real. They wrote about it. They, they, gave, they basically wrote about the temptation and what was real to them and how they avoided it. But God, but Jesus, but nevertheless. They weren't taking away the facts that happened in life. They just was in, this, oh, they introduced their facts to the truth of who God is. And any time you take a fact to the truth of God, God's truth will always overcome your facts. The fact is your marriage may be in a shambles today. But if the truth of God's word comes into that husband and wife, the facts are going to change. The fact is, you may be in some financial struggles, but if you'll line up with the, with the biblical financial plan of the Bible, then the truth of the word of God about your finances will change the facts of your finances. If your church is struggling and there's empty seats, if your church is struggling and people's not getting saved, then if the church will get in the word of God, and do, not just read it, do it. And the, if the facts are the church is stagnant, if there's empty seats in your church, those are facts. But when the Christians and the Word of God become true, then that truth of the Word will change the facts of any church's growth. But it goes back to the subtitle. It's your choice. The Bible says, choose you this day whom you will serve. But he declared, as for me and my house, we're going to serve God. We're not just going to read it, we're going to serve God. Let's stand our feet this morning. Wow. Man, get encouraged this morning, church. Get out of that spirit of discouragement. It may, you may have to break a generational curse. Are you listening to me? More than likely, you're going to have to break what we call a generational bloodline curse. You grew up in a discouraging family. You was raised by discouraging people. You hang out with discouraging people. You go to church with discouraging people. And it's just what you've done. And you think, this is just who I am. But who are you according to the Word? You are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. You are the head, you're not the tail. You are above that and you're not beneath it. You are who God says you are, not who mom and dad, if they said something discouraging, you are not that. You are not who the teacher said you were when the teacher got on you. You're who God says you are. God says you're my righteousness. You're my sons and daughters. You're able to do more and above and abundantly anything you can think or imagine through my words, he says. He sees you as that. And it's time you see yourself as that and rise above. Everybody say, rise above. rise above. If you're here this morning, I don't want you to go to the land of, oh, no, I want you to go to the land of, oh, yeah. If, you, if, if you're here today and you say, you know what, I know I need to get saved. Satan's going to tell you, oh, no, you don't. Oh, no, you don't. You're fine. You're going to make it. Don't worry. You go to church. It don't matter if you go to church. You can go to church and go to hell. Billy Graham. Everybody say, Billy Graham. Billy Graham is said out of his own mouth. The church is going to be surprised at how many of them is not going to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Because they go to church, but they've never given their life to Jesus Christ. Religion will not get you there. You have to be in a full-on relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus. And that's what we're offering you this morning. We're not offering you religion anything. We're not offering you even, we don't even, we don't even want you to join church until after you get saved. We want you to find where God plants you. Well, you're welcome here. We want you here. But man, we want you perfectly where God wants you. But today, we just want to make sure you know him before you leave. So if you're here this morning, I'm going to ask you to bow your heads. If you're here this morning and, and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, but you say, oh yeah, instead of oh no today, just lift your hand up right now. Anybody in the house need to get born again? Anybody? Because that's about seven, eight Sundays in a row we haven't had a salvation in this house. Who would say today, that's partially my fault? 
going to raise my hand. It's partially my fault. I'm not going to take all the blame. I'm not the only one that goes here. If you're here this morning and you've been in a generation of discouragement, I mean this right here. This is, this is going to be a very specific altar call. We'll pray for anything. And a lot of times I don't do specific because people are like, well, I'm not going to go because people's going to think. Let me tell you something. That pride will take, take you to hell in a heartbeat. That pride will keep you living in hell in your current life. And if you can't break that pride, you ain't never going to break the spirit of discouragement over yourself. Part of what I want this team up here to pray for when you walk up is ask you, is there a spirit of discouragement out of your family? Did you grow up in a discouraging atmosphere? And if, they, if you tell them, yeah, I did, you ain't got to go into details. We don't want details. We just, they're going to lay hands on you and they're going to bind it and they're going to break it and they're going to cast that thing off you in Jesus' name this morning. It's time to quit playing with this demon. This self-gratifying, self-justifying demon's got to go. And it is a, it is a demon. Don't think it ain't. You've got to get that off you. It doesn't mean you're demonic. This means that oppression comes on you. And that just, it's a heavy weight you aren't designed to bear. God says, cast your, your weight, your cares upon me. You've been toting this stuff way too long. Don't listen to Satan. Don't listen to others who are discouraging. And don't listen to yourself right now be discouraging. If you're here this morning, you say, man, I need that. I want to be refreshed. I'm ready for that fresh air, that, that breath of God to blow into my life. Raise your hand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah, real people raising real hands. Come on. Woo, thank you, Jesus. All right, put those hands down. You're fixing to get the opportunity to activate what you say you want. A lot of times we say we want something. We'll raise a hand, yeah. But when it comes time to actually do the work, when it comes time to actually step out in faith and say, here I am, and I'm not ashamed of where I'm at. And I, 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 the only thing I'm ashamed of is I've stayed here this long, but not a day, not a day longer, say, not a, not a, I'm not even going to walk into this afternoon the same way I walked into this church today. Because the power of God is here to set the captives free, those that want to be free. So if you want to get free from discouragement, and it's a spiritual discouragement, and it's been in your generation, and you've got kids, and maybe you even see it starting to manifest in your kids, but you don't want to pass it on to them. You want to pass a generational blessing of encouragement now to your kids. And watch that thing begin to manifest. If that's you, I want you to come up here during this altar time here in just a moment. But we're going to pray over our, everybody say tithes. Tithes and offerings. This is the last thing we do. It's the last thing on our mind, but we don't forget to do it because it is a part that honors God. Listen to me, church. Tithing honors God. It honors His Word. It honors your faithfulness. So that's why we do it right here, right now, during this time. If you're from another church, please do not give your tithe to Journey Church. It belongs to your church. We want you to give it there. We're just glad you're here today for whatever reason. But right now, real serious, we're going to tithe part of worship. That's why we go back into worship to do it. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we come to you this morning. God, it's been fun. We showed a little funny video, had some fun. But Lord, this is real. This is, this is kingdom business, kingdom work right now that needs to happen in the lives of, of many people here today, God. So Lord, come do a mighty work in us, Lord. You don't do anything in a small portion, God. Look at us, Lord. We're made in your image, God the mind and the heart to know and to love you and to be obedient to you and Satan hates that about us that's why he brings us into discouragement that's why he tries to bring us up in an atmosphere of discouragement and complaining and whining and crying but you Lord you among all people Lord could have complained and whined but you got on that cross you said Father forgive them they don't even know what they're doing thank you for forgiving me that day God and I bring you my tithe to honor you I bring you my tithe as an extension of my faithfulness to the whole counsel of the word of God in my life God and I give it with a glad heart. Say that with me. Say, I'm giving today with a glad and joyful heart to obey, to obey my God and His Word. Magnify it, God. Use it for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, I'm going to worship you right now, Lord. I'm going to get delivered today, and I'm going to be set free in the joy of the Lord. Come on, church. Lift your hands. Lift your voices to God. Come on. Here we go.